probably see a little pop-up saying we are now being recorded. So welcome to those of you now joining us on YouTube as well. So my name is Jamie Vibach and I am the Will County Director for the Conservation Foundation. I have also been your host and guide on this wonderful conservation tour that we've been doing for the last six months, crazy. Um, once again, as this is a webinar format, everybody's muted, your cameras are off. So uh, if you're joining us in your pajamas or whatever, drinking your coffee, you know, welcome. Um, this webinar is being recorded so that everybody can enjoy it later. As I mentioned, we're keeping these on our YouTube channel. So um, if you have to leave early or something calls you away, that's fine. It'll be uploaded to YouTube within a day. If you have any questions, please use that Q&A box that lets everybody see your questions. Also makes it easier for us to find them all because um, the questions can sometimes get lost in the chat. So we'll answer any questions that you have at the end. Um, for your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in the chat, but just in case I missed a setting or something, please don't click links other than what we may post. On the TCF side of things, these webinars are offered free to the public. However, we do encourage you to consider a donation or a membership. The more people we have attending, the more it costs us to run them. So at the end of the webinar, you will magically be transported to a page on our website that has a whole bunch of resources of great things, including um, some of the brochures we put out about butterflies and rain gardens and native plants, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but our, also there will be our virtual tip jar. So um, if you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help keep us running. And there's also a button on there you can check to become a member so that you can enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff as well. And to sweeten the deal, we have a grant that will match all new donations right now through the end of the year up to $75,000. So for example, if you donate $25, we actually get $50. So if you've been thinking about donating, now is a great time to do it. Anything you contribute will be doubled. So really, really great opportunity that we have right now. So if you're considering donating, I really encourage you to think about doing that because of that uh, matching grant that we have. All right, as I said, we have been doing these webinars weekly and we've got another great one coming up for you next week as well. On Wednesday, October 21st, we will be celebrating October with a healthy yard. And we will be joined by Melissa Custick, who is the Chicago Regional Trees Initiative Specialist from the Morton Arboretum. And so really, really looking forward to that one. So um, please make sure you join us next week for that one. But for now, I am going to turn it over to Farmer Jason Holm, our very good friend from Green Earth Harvest, and he's got a great tour, little virtual tour for us of the farm, uh, as well as lots of great information too. So Jason, you wanna take it away? Thanks, Jamie. So my name is Jason. I'm the farmer here at Green Earth Harvest, which is a program of the Conservation Foundation. So Jamie and I are coworkers. Um, and what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna give you kind of a short overview of the farm itself. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what we do. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how some of the farm practices that we use can potentially be carried over into a home garden, which it sounds like most attendees here have a garden. Um, so a few things. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, I'll kind of keep an eye on it uh, through most of the presentation. Um, and I think Jamie will as well. And if you can't hear me or if you're having issues like that, um, also make a note of it in the chat and uh, we'll attend to it pretty quickly. Um, so let me just share my screen here. Perfect. My lovely email inbox. And here we are. Um, I'm going to start actually in Google Maps. So I'm going to give you kind of an idea of where we are. Um, it seems like most of you are from roughly within our six county or so service area in generally suburban Chicagoland. Um, but this is a bird's eye view of Chicagoland. You can see a little bit of Wisconsin, a little bit of Michigan, a little bit of Indiana over here. So if you we zoom in here, we're about 30, maybe 35 miles west to southwest of 
downtown Chicago. I have it in the satellite view so that you can really see how surrounded by urban and suburban sprawl we are. You can see a few forest preserves, a few um, islands of habitat in here, but overall, as we get closer and closer, we are very suburbanized. You can see all these subdivisions. Um, again, Springbrook Prairie, a great forest preserve, Green Valley, a great forest preserve. And then the farm is right here, surrounded by subdivisions. And in fact, you can see surrounding this 60 acre property, um, a street that dead ends right here on kind of the top side of it. And then another street that dead ends down here. Um, I'm not sure if the intent was ever to connect them, but at one point it was almost a foregone conclusion that this farm would be paved over and turned into a subdivision. And at Green Earth Harvest, we're pretty grateful that it has not turned out that way. Um, and now I will start this slideshow. <coughs> so as I said before, Green Earth Harvest is a program of the Conservation Foundation, so our missions are really one and the same. We're here to support the health of the land and the local community and everything that that entails and everything that supports that. Um, if you have any questions, I'll pop up my email again later, um, but I'm the farm manager here on McDonald Farm in Naperville. Um, and so the first question is, what do we do? We grow vegetables almost full stop. That's the vast majority of what we do once you really get into it, it turns out that there's a lot that's involved with growing vegetables. I don't who would have thought, um, but we kind of grow everything from winter squash that you see in this, the pumpkins and kabocha squash, the summer spring and fall green squash, summer hot peppers, and spaghetti squash, which you see all right there. Um, we grow everything from, we have grown asparagus in the past, all the way down to zucchini. So we probably grow in any given year, I would guess 45 or so different crops. And among those 45 crops, we probably grow, grow 150 to 200 varieties most years. Um, and I showed you guys where we're at. Um, and so I wanna talk briefly about farms as open space because the Conservation Foundation generally deals in open space forest preserves, preserving land, um, and a, an organic farm, uh, farms in general, but an organic farm in particular, I think is an interesting kind of third model of conservation. It's not paved over. It's not dedicated exclusively to biodiversity. It rests somewhere in the middle where we are able to serve the needs of humans and our com human community, and we also cater to and support a healthy non-human community. And I think if you ask me, the um, actually the only way to support a healthy human community is to support a healthy non-human plant animal community uh, as well. And so you can see kind of some of the green space, as I mentioned before, it's a little limited um, in the area, but you can see there's some green space up here, and there's some green space down here. And there's a little more as you get further down the uh, DuPage River. We're very close to the confluence of the east and west branches of the DuPage River. And um, what you find is that our farm becomes kind of a sanctuary and a corridor for wildlife passing through. We have uh, hawks, owls, deer, coyotes, people have seen a bald eagle or two over the farm as well. And so farms really do contribute to conservation in a, in a lot of different ways. And we'll get more into that. Um, I'm curious how many of you have been to the farm before? Um, the farm itself, this 60 acre property was last Oh, and McDonald family. Uh, and she donated it in 1992 after she kind of saw the encroach of 
urban sprawl. And the story, as I've heard it, is that she sold off kind of a back portion of the real property of her farm to her church for you know pretty low price. And they kind of promised her they would build like a, a retirement home or a retirement community and that she could live out her days there uh, once she you know, was kind of past the most active years of her life. Well, if you see in this, there's no retirement community. There's no retirement home. It's just cookie cutter, very nice homes, but cookie cutter homes. Uh, put up in housing development that kind of blends together with the whole suburban sprawl feel of Naperville in general. Um, that from what I've heard, I obviously was not here at the time, but from what I've heard, she wasn't, wasn't too pleased with that. Uh, it was just thought out the conversation was very simple that even at that time, 30 years, there was still a long history of preserving land and making sure that there were as many islands, multi islands um, of of preserves and of habitat. Um, so it was donated in 1992 to the Conservation Foundation. We then moved over um, our headquarters in 1997 or in the late 90s at least. Um, and then Green Earth Institute, which I'll get into in a minute, began in 2003. It was our Green Earth Institute's first growing season growing organic vegetables. Um, let me just look at the chat. I'm curious to hear what you guys are saying. I can't. Oh. Your audio is cutting out a little bit here and there, Jason. It's just getting real quiet for some reason. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, I'll sit a little bit closer and, and hopefully it, um, oh, hey, David. Um, and hopefully that helps a little bit. But let me know if there's anything you guys miss in particular, and I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, sorry about that. Thanks for bearing with us. Um, and so I'm just going to play a little bit of video from this overhead drone footage that was taken at the farm, I think, last year. Uh, and I'm going to show you guys a couple of small clips to get you a sense of, of what we're looking at. Um, So right here, you can see uh, this is the view from Knock Knolls Road, kind of looking up. And the fields that you see, there are a lot of them. It's large, but they're actually just over a quarter of the property itself. Um, so this is one of the quadrants on the farm. And this is a good overview. Mm -hmm. And now these are some of the, this is like the main barn complex. Um, and you can see, I'm gonna pause it right there. You can see some of these greenhouses that we grow in ground vegetables in, in the spring and fall. Um, this is the barn where most people come to pick up their vegetable shares. This is our wash pack where we wash uh, most of our vegetables that come in, some like, tomatoes, peppers, things that are a little more susceptible to moisture damage um, don't get washed necessarily with water. This is our north greenhouse where we grow uh, most of our seedlings throughout the year. And then this little structure right next to this garage building is the chicken coop where we will start onions in February. We grow microgreens in there. Um, it's about 75, maybe 100 square feet, but it is a really important piece of the farm also. Play it here. And then this is a good overview just of the property in general. Mm -hmm. 
And this is, I think, the best view of the back half of the farm, which is what you cannot see from the road. Um, so this is that north greenhouse that we talked about where we grow a lot of our seedlings. And then these are the two west greenhouses where we grow in ground predominantly for the early spring share and for the late fall share, um, where it becomes too cold um, or it starts out too cold in the spring and then becomes quickly too cold. Uh, in the late fall as well. And I have a little more drone footage later on that I'll show you that actually just got taken last week. That shows less of the farm, but I think looks a little cooler as well. Um, quick history lesson for you too. Uh, the farm, the vegetable farm, the organic vegetable farm started out as Green Earth Institute. Uh, we started in 2002 by a uh, if he was a member of the Conservation Foundation at the time, Steve Ewald, it would be a crime to not mention that his wife, Karen Hutt, also um, was instrumental in the success of the farm in the early years. And Steve really intertwined um, the spirit of volunteerism. Uh, he named it the Green Earth Institute because he viewed education uh, being an enormous piece of what the farm would do. And then obviously vegetable production. Um, so I'm not positive how many shareholders we Green Earth Institute started with, but it has even 10 years ago, I know it was under 100 or right around 100. And right now for our main season, we have 575 current shareholders. So we've clearly grown a lot in the past 18 years or so, or 17 years since we started growing in 2003. We originally started with one, you can kind of see each of these individual fields. We started with one field here. Then the second year it grew to two, which is crazy, doubling your capacity of growing and it grew to three. And then they put in um, an underground irrigation system that you know can get water to all. And so now we have 10, we have something like 25 or 30 different fields that we grow all roughly an acre or so. Um, so it, it really is important to you know keep in mind. Steve worked really hard to begin Green Earth Institute um, and it really harnessed a lot of energy in the community around for healthy food, for community engagement. And so we really try to keep that alive as we move forward. In 2018, at the beginning of it, Steve stepped down from his position as executive director of Green Earth Institute. He retired for the second time and he um, and Green Earth Institute then merged with the Conservation Foundation, who Green Earth Institute had been leasing the land from for a long time. So it was a partnership that was already really good, was already great, really healthy, a lot of common goals in mind. And over the past two years, we've um, really embedded ourselves into the operations of the Conservation Foundation and our merger two years on is just about complete, which feels really nice. Um, we're it's a great home for the center of the organic farming. Um, and we are the only organic farm in Naperville, which is great. Although we would love to see more. So our mission is that we grow healthy. We grow healthy soil, then we grow healthy vegetables, then we grow healthy people. This is a picture of our farm crew, or a few members of our farm crew and a pizza slice. Um, and we also grow healthy communities by distributing vegetables, by improving the culture of growing food, by connecting people, by having events at the farm. Um, so, and we feel that if we grow healthy soil, you can't grow healthy communities without first growing healthy soil. And there are a few pieces in there, in that chain that lead to growing healthy communities. But that, that's what we feel very strongly about.
um, a common question that we have is where do you sell? And so we have, it says plant sales, it should say plant sale. Um, we do the vast majority of our business is in our farm shares. Like I said, in the main season, we have 575 shareholders. And I'll explain a little bit more about the farm share kind of program. Um, a few slides. We have a farm stand on Wednesdays from three to six uh, through the summer and this year through likely the end of October, right at the foot of our driveway where we sell fresh organic vegetables. Um, and then we have plant sale, uh, a plant sale in May, where we grow seedling or where we sell seedlings. We also might this year sell some seeds. We sell compost. Um, we sell really nice herb boxes, handmade, and we grow everything that we sell. So we grow everything at the plant sale from seed to plant, and everything at the farm stand and farm shares from seed all the way up to fruit or leaf or vegeta final vegetable. Um, so it's a great feeling as people come up to the farm stand, they say, oh, where was this grown? And you can just turn and say right here, um, oftentimes right in the fields that they can see, which is a great feeling. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about kind of the individual um, sales avenues, I guess. So our farm stand, we started last year. Uh, it runs from 3 to 6 p.m. on Wednesday afternoons. So if you get out there today, you can see Jackson. They will have, I think, broccoli, um, baby kale, kale, hakari turnips, which are really delicious sweet salad turnips, cabbage, and a few other things, scallions, a few other things. So we sell predominantly vegetables there. Uh, one of the big ones that we sell is tomatoes. We're well past the tomato season this year, at least the big tomato season. But uh, at our farm stand, we sell pounds and pounds of bulk tomatoes. Um, we also sell honey that's produced on the farm. There's a beekeeper that ha his only hives are now on the farm property itself. And so honey is bottled from there. We sell it at our farm stand, at our farm share uh, pickups. So that's great. And then we also will occasionally in the summer sell flowers. We are selling these support your local farmer shirts uh, and we'll sell other small things from the farm throughout the year as well. Our plant sale, which is one of my Peppers, tomatoes, summer squash, winter squash, cucumbers, melons, compost bags, herbs, planter gifts. Um, there's a lot that we sell there. It's also this past year we had to transition into a kind of a drive through pre order model, but most years it's this really awesome um, open house where we do farm tours and there's children's activities, and you can also buy native plants here, which is a byproduct of merging with the Conservation Foundation that we can support the mission of growing healthy vegetables and healthy landscapes all in one fell swoop. Um, so this is the Saturday before Mother's Day. I believe every year it has been at least few past few years. And it, um, it's really a great way to kick off the season. Definitely, we love having a ton of people on the farm or before this year at least, we loved having a ton of people on the farm. After kind of a winter where you don't really, not as many people get to experience the joy of the farm. So in these pictures, you can see tomatoes the day before the plant sale. You see some of the, this is a yellow zucchini actually that we grow or a golden zucchini, goldie, that we grew this year. Uh, and then a ton of basil plants before they get potted up into their final um, into their final sales pots. Um, Melissa asked, and I missed this, this was a few minutes ago, but Melissa asked, do you give any donations of plants or veggies to the community? And we work with Loaves and Fishes, um, which is a local food pantry 
that works to alleviate hunger in our local community, we will give them a lot of, we will sort our tomatoes, sort our potatoes, sort our peppers. And a lot of times when we sort things, we have our firsts for, for us to sell, for us to sell. Then we have our seconds to sell, the firsts are to sell or put into farm shares. Then we have our seconds, which we'll donate almost always. Um, and then we have our thirds, which are compost. So we do work with loaves and fishes to give them surplus uh, seconds or sometimes even firsts if we just have way too much. And one thing that I definitely pride ourselves on, or we pride ourselves on, is that um, a lot of times grocery stores will kind of give whatever they have that's bad to these, to loaves and fishes or to other food banks. Um, and we really make sure that we're giving them something that they know that they can hand out and that they know people will appreciate. Um, we don't give them compost, basically. We also received a grant this year to give 10 low-income families um, farm shares at no charge to them, but the grant pays us for that. Um, and so we've been able to expand some access to people who otherwise wouldn't be able to access um, our food, which is great. Um, and we hope to continue that on an ongoing basis in the next few years. So we're looking for potential avenues to fund that, to help us with it. Um, but that is really central to what we want to do going forward. And then we also have donated or have sold at a really discounted price plants to local community gardens in the past. Um, Anish, we do not have orchards. We do have a few fruit, a few fruit trees, as Jamie said. Um, we have a volunteer who's kind of in buffers, planting um, in the buffers, like right along the edges of the property, planting a few, a few fruit trees, but not anything resembling an orchard. This year, we did have strawberries that shareholders could, um, could come and you pick for the first time, which is really exciting. And then we're on to the most exciting part, the farm shares. Um, we have three seasons. We have our spring share, which is basically four weeks from Mother's Day to Father's Day. We have about 150 shareholders for that. We have our main season, 20 weeks of marathon. Runs from about Father's Day or mid-June, mid a little bit before Father's Day. Halloween, the end of October. We got two and a half more weeks left. Um, and then we have our fall share, which is the month of November, basically, from Halloween to Thanksgiving. And so these three pictures aren't, they don't encapsulate everything you would get in a farm share, but they're good snapshots. Um, in the spring, you get a lot more greens. In the main season, you get a, an odd mix of stuff. You get greens, you might get some microgreens, you get tomatoes, some root crops, and towards the end, you probably start to see some of the, start to see, whew, talking a little too fast. You probably start to see some of these root uh, storage crops like onions. Then in the fall, you get really gorgeous greens, really gorgeous um, frost sweetened greens. You get collards, you get kale. And then you also get a lot of storage crops. You get pie pumpkins, daikon radish, turnips, watermelon radish, onions, rutabaga, butternut squash, spaghetti squash. And then in many years, you will, in many years, particularly when it's mild out, you'll get the last of the summer crops too. So you'll get um, sweet peppers or you'll get hot peppers. Um, this year, it's frosted a few times over, but our storage crops look really excellent. Um, so it'll be this year in our fall share, fall share, basically every week people will have an option of, in addition to other smaller things, potatoes, beets, onions, carrots, cabbage, collards, kale, butternut squash, um, radishes, tur sweet salad, turnips. So you really get a lot of different variety. Now I'll talk a little bit about what's in a share. So depending on your size, you can get one of two sizes. 
either get about six items a week or about nine items. This, this year, in this season, um, so our largest ones yesterday, we were able to get nine items plus five. Um, next week, I, we may go up to 10 items. It really depends on how much we have. The very least you would get is eight items a week. Um, so you can either do standard, which is nine items a week, personal, which is six items a week, and then you either do every week or every other week. So it's, there are really four different options in sizes for you. Um, we also have throughout the season, you pick green beans, you pick cherry tomatoes, um, you pick snow and snap peas. And then this year, as I alluded to before, we also had um, shareholders who could come in and buy a little pint and pick strawberries, which were the best strawberries I've ever had. I've had fresh strawberries before too. Uh, and then new this year, we have chances for shareholders to buy products from other farmers. So we have um, a couple that raises meat and dairy humanely, um, just over in Marcel's, Illinois. So they come up every three weeks. We next year, we are hoping to have a fruit farmer come in. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea. These are four photos of everything we harvested that week. So these are, this is basically what you would get a choice from. And a lot of times for say, say for lettuce, it would be two heads of lettuce, it would be one head of lettuce, or if we're onion, it would be four onions. Um, so that explains the quantity of the I wanna talk a little bit about our crew too. At the top, I one goal. Uh, in the picture, there are eight people. Jess left that one. Jess, who's worked on the farm, I think this would have been her fourth year. She left, worked about half of the season, and then left in May or June uh, to move down to Georgia to start her own pet shop. Our season, our working season, typically runs from March to November. We vary a lot in age. We are mostly stacked at the younger end of the spectrum, but Augustine has worked on the farm for about 13 or 14 years now. And I, he turned either 64 or 65 um, this year and is still faster than just about everyone. So it's, we get to know each other pretty well. This is a big part of us growing a healthy community is learning how to grow food in our local um, ecology learning those skills, conserving that culture of growing food. Uh, we begin hiring roughly in February. So if you know anyone who might be interested in working on an organic farm, please jot my email down, have them send me an email and we'll follow up throughout the winter. Now I'll get on to the part that I think a lot of you probably wanted to hear more about. We conserve water, energy, soil, and biodiversity. And I'm going to talk about pet cotton. Jason, do you want to say that again? You're cutting out. We're having a hard time hearing you. Yeah, we so we conserve we conserve water, energy, soil, and biodiversity, soil and fertility. Um, and then these are some of the pests that we have to manage for. We manage for deer, certain types of bugs, for rodents. We also manage for pathogens, even before this year. Um, fungal, bacterial, viral, um, on plants. And so, in terms of conserving water, we store rainwater. We store about 25,000 gallons at a time when it rains, which wasn't very often this year. Fortunately, we also have a well that we can fill that cistern with, but that cistern is what we water our fields with. So all irrigation water comes out of that cistern. We have downspouts on the barn and on several other buildings on the property that all feed into this underground cistern. And one way you could 
um, kind of institute that in your, in your home garden is to have a rain barrel, which the Conservation Foundation also sells basically at cost for us. Um, we're really trying to get people to conserve water, um, keep from over, you know, take some of that rainwater, try to keep from overflowing our storm systems or our storm drain systems. Um, we use drip tape on some crops, which is, you know, very long, thin hoses basically that drips out very uh, infrequent or very low amounts of water. Um, this creates less evaporation, particularly in the heat of summer. And it also creates less disease for tomatoes, for peppers, for squash, things that if you watered from overhead might have fungal issues. Um, one way you could kind of recreate this at your house or in your garden is to use soaker hoses. Uh, I've never used them before, but it seems to me that they would kind of simulate that similar effect. Um, and then we also reuse our water or pass our water on down, downstream um, from our wash pack. We have a French drain that goes into the Resiliency Institute Permaculture Garden, which is also on site. Um, we also conserve energy. We have a wind turbine at the farm and we have solar panels. Those provide, I've heard, up to about a third of the electricity on the farm property. On the farm property, we have water supplies about 20 or so from it. So it's not a trivial amount of electricity that they provide. They also conserve energy with greenhouses. They're kind of farming's first or one of farming's first um, modern batteries. We, they're covered in clear plastic the sun shines through them, it heats up in the house, and then the, <coughs> and then the heat is less likely or not able to escape as quickly as the sunlight was able to get in. Um, so that keeps us from having to heat our greenhouse or heat our growing space. Um, and it's just passive solar, we don't really use much, if any, heating in the fall, even when it hits 10, 15 degrees or so in these greenhouses. And then we also really, <clears throat> pardon me, we also really strive to use appropriate tools for the task. So all the way to the left, you see what modern farming looks like sometimes in Iowa, in central Illinois. And then in the middle, you see what farming sometimes looks like for us. Uh, when we're seeding things. This is one of our smallest tractors. I kind of intentionally used it to make a point, but we don't have combines. We don't have very large machinery. We work a lot by hand. And really every year we're transitioning more and more cultivation into hand cultivation. Um, what can we do on a smaller scale, but what can we do better? And we really want to use less plastic, less fossil fuels. What can we create more of with less is a question that we often ask ourselves. And then really our, the center of our work on the farm is our soil and fertility. We, um, fertility is both biological and chemical. So we, in addition to growing vegetables, <laughs> We also fallow fields, so we have like a crop rotation um, after, say, tomatoes, which are very, they feed a lot of nitrogen. They require a lot of nitrogen from the soil, which when people talk about fertility is often what they're talking about. So tomatoes require a lot of nitrogen from the soil. After tomatoes, the next year we will either grow a cover crop, like this red clover, Sometimes we find some four leaf clovers on the farm too. Um, or we will sometimes let it go fallow or let it go bare. More often we'll plant cover crop. We're always trying to get roots into the soil. We really don't want bare soil for more than a week or two at a time because then you start to get wind erosion, water erosion, uh, and it's not great. 
And those cover crops will fix nitrogen, they'll add carbon, or they'll fix carbon and add it to the soil, which is great for the soil. And they just add more organic matter, um, which feeds microorganisms and animals in the soil. And as a result of that, we can start to build healthy soil, healthy vegetables, healthy people, and then healthy communities. Um, the organic guidelines actually require that you take into consideration, particularly soil and fertility conservation. Um, they address water, they address energy, they address biodiversity, but they really focus on the soil. And so they are, we're certified organic by MOSA, whose logo you can see here. Um, and one of the big ways also that we add fertility to the soil is we use a limited amount of compost that we mix ourselves with um, horse manure and with leaves. And so that's one thing that you can do at your house. You can sow cover crops. Um, you can sow cover crops underneath your vegetables. You can compost. You can use your leaves even to mulch. Even if you just have leaves that you mulch in the winter, you're gonna keep, you're gonna keep soil from running off. You're gonna contribute to building that soil. So that's a good first step, uh, even if you're not ready to start playing around with cover crops. And we also conserve biodiversity. We are required by organic certification to have buffers between our fields and any pesticide residue, which we don't really have in scale, like some of our other organic farms don't do such really high yield anymore. We have several natural areas on the farm. Um, we, as I mentioned before, diversify between the crops and the rows that we're growing. Um, and we also focus on habitat construction, uh, not just preservation. So we will. Um, you know, we really like to encourage hawks and coyotes on the farm. It's part of our pest management strategy. So we really keep our pathways mowed. Um, we really keep our fields, try to keep them very well weeded because we know that that will attract hawks, that will attract coyotes. That adds to biodiversity and it takes out some pests that we have. Um, and so you can definitely do this on your own home, own home scale. You can. Uh, have little natural areas in your, in your yard, especially if you have a larger yard. Uh, you can rotate crops, even if it's in a really small garden. That's wise to do. Um, it's wise to plant more than one type of crop also, even if you have a small garden. And now, that's a good segue into integrated pest management. I'm go through this pretty quickly. Um, integrated pest management, you can see up here, is just a science-based approach. And at its heart, it really tries to prevent using pesticides as much as possible. In fact, it really tries to prevent using synthetic pesticides as much as possible. Um, which we are, uh, under organic regulations, we don't use synthetic pesticides ever. They, you cannot use them on an organic farm. We use a few organic pesticides that are derived from, um, I think one is derived from ragweed in particular, or Bt, which is derived from a bacteria. Um, the bacteria is Bt is the initials. So we use a few pesticides, but we have this whole schematic to really try to keep ourselves from having to go that route. So the steps really quickly are just identify and monitor, evaluate, what is acceptable damage? Prevent and prevent. Um, prevention often comes before identifying and monitoring for us because we know what pests we often deal with. Um, action, which might be trapping, might be pesticide use. It might be saying, there's not really much we can do about this, um, which is not never a fun feeling to have, but sometimes that's, that's the reality and you really have to weigh how much benefit will an action carry versus how much time will it take what is the ecological cost and then you continue to monitor the pest um, and this is really a circular 
uh, flow. So you're constantly doing all five of these. Now, if you live in the Chicago suburbs, you probably have deer damage in your garden. You're so overpopulated. <laughs> so I can tell you right now, one of your actions is social. It's support coyote populations, and it's support your local forest preserves when they do decide. Once your damage occurs, you're not going to be able to stop. You can monitor, you can watch for animals, footprints, and you can watch for damage to foliage. Then you kind of have to evaluate what is acceptable damage. Um, deer can really devastate a crop. There's not many times where they will just do acceptable damage. They'll chew through lettuce, they'll chew through radicchio, they'll chew through beet greens and spinach. Um, the best prevention is fencing. Um, if you have a large yard, try to plant in places where you know deer don't really come through very often. And then on the farm, we also cover our greens with a small um, or with a really thin fabric. And that seems to work pretty well. <coughs> I mentioned it before, but we have rodents. Um, we have a lot of them. And that's because a lot of meso predators like just aren't coyote population in general. Coming back, they're rebounding quickly, but they are, have been devastated. Uh, hawk populations aren't as high We monitor, we just basically monitor damage to foliage, seedlings, and roots. And then we evaluate. The levels for acceptable damage are drastically different between a greenhouse, the field, and storage of a crop. In crop storage, the acceptable level is zero, period. In a greenhouse, as you're starting to grow them into little seedlings, you really don't want to see much. You really cannot accept that much damage because that's should be the most sheltered time in the plant's life. In the field, there's really not a lot you can do. Um, as far as prevention goes, you can intercrop marigolds, scallions, onions are often really good uh, prevention plants. You can use raised beds, hopefully that keeps them out. You can put it in wire barriers underneath your vegetable beds. We use this product called Plant Skid, which is organically approved. You just sprinkle it on your bed and it is a deterrent. It's an organic deterrent. We also use noise and light deterrents um, in our greenhouses particularly. They, you leave the lights on in your room, mice aren't gonna come into it very often. Uh, and then we also use mouse traps also. So appropriate trapping is really a big, uh, the big action step there. For bugs, like flea beetles, we monitor, we watch damage to crops. We regulate crowding, we sample, we cut them really close. Uh, we've also spent plants in cities to see what kind of species to monitor. And then we- Jason, if, you wanna say that again? Sorry, you cut out. Oh yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, we've also, so we can monitor with sticky traps just to see the levels of bugs. Um, the damage to crops, regular scouting, you may have to get on your hands and knees in your garden to really see if you're having damage from, from um, certain animals, from certain bugs. And then we've also sent um, actually stalks of broccoli before to the University of Illinois Extension to see if they could tell us what was causing a certain damage. Um, then we have to evaluate. Eliminating an insect or bug population is almost always impossible. It's not really that desirable. We don't really care that the bug is there. We care that the damage is there. And so your acceptable damage level varies between crops. Potatoes can be defoliated, meaning their leaves can be eaten. They could eat half of the leaves. Depending on the life stage of the potato, it may not matter at all. We don't eat potato leaves, we eat potato tubers. Um, radishes can get defoliated pretty heavily. Arugula, not so much because we eat the arugula leaf. You know, so you have to keep that in mind. What are they damaging? What part of the plant? What part of the plant is a crop? Prevention is crop rotation, intercropping as with rodents, um, barriers. So uh, you can use, for some bugs, you can use um, the same thing we use for deer, just a thin fabric covering your plants. Um, 
and then appropriate timing. So we know that flea beetles are really bad in the summer. We don't really plant that many greens in the summer as a result. And the ones that we do, we work really hard to keep them. Um, and then action can be hand control, picking, squishing, kind of gross, but pretty, pretty nice to be able to do on a small scale. Um, we use pesticide application also, bio, bio pesticides on our farm. Action for bugs in particular is exponentially more effective at early stages. As soon as you see a bug in your garden, a pest that is, you should be thinking about how you're going to control it. This is a really good graphic of acceptable damage from a um, pest. You can barely see on this arugula the holes. I think most people would probably eat that. This broccoli, whoa, my. This broccoli is really not going to grow into much. Um, and then finally, pathogens, appropriate for this year. Um, we monitor. And then we evaluate how many days are left for the crop. Pathogens will spread. You can never do or even slowly spread. Um, for tomatoes, oftentimes a fungal uh, infection will kind of consume the entire crop by the time it's by the time it's lost its ability. But we know at the beginning of October, we're not going to do anything for that because we know that it wouldn't really pay off. It wouldn't be worth the ecological, the monetary, or the time cost to apply any biopesticide or take any big action. Um, to prevent, you can do preventative applications of some biopesticides, like hydrogen peroxide is a really common one for really heavily diluted hydrogen peroxide is really common for tomatoes in particular. You can increase spacing so there's more airflow going through preventing the pathogen spread. And then appropriate irrigation, you don't overwater. Water the roots, not the leaves, because that's where the plant uses it. And then your actions, once you do see it, are you can do pesticide application. Even for us, we don't really do that very often. Um, we usually just keep on top of the harvest. We plant several successions of many crops that are really susceptible to pathogens. Um, and then particularly on a home garden level, you can pull out all the plant residue at the end of the year. So if I had a small garden, I would not be leaving tomatoes in the ground to rot. I would be pulling them out, composting them, um, something like that. Um, and that's about it. all I have for you. I just want to remind you our farm stands are Wednesdays from 3 to 6. This is my email. Um, you can reach out to me with any questions you have that may not get answered here, any comments, questions about the farm in general. Um, and then here are a few steps to engage with us now. We have our email list, blog, and recipes. And then again, there's my email. Sorry, I kind of had to rush through that. <laughs> That's okay. That was great, Jason. Thank you so much for all of that. Uh, we do have one question here. Um, one of our attendees would like to know, do you leave cut cover crop on the garden after cutting it down? I would, yeah. We, when we cover crop, we seed it, we let it grow, um, and then we cut it. And it just depends on if you want to plant into it right away. Um, you can either kind of incorporate it into the soil uh, or you can just leave it there to kind of die down um, and incorporate it into the soil with time. But yeah, I would leave it on the garden. Great. Um, so one question that I've had, I have had a garden for a number of years. I grow tomatoes, I grow cucumbers, peppers, had varying luck with lots of different things. Um, but one thing I can never seem to have a lot of luck with is peppers. I've got, you know, the plants come up and the plants look healthy. They never get super big, but they just never really produce very much. So what, what tips would you have to have more productive pepper plants? I would, um, 
peppers are difficult. And for me, they're, we've had good luck with them in the past few years, but for me, they're always really stressful because it's like, they're never there until they are. <laughs> since it's just like somehow some way they usually come through for us but they re they rely a lot on a mineral rich soil so you could if you really wanted to if you really were really curious you could get a soil test and okay. see what your soil looks like they're fairly cheap i would think that one sample would run like 15 20 dollars but i'm not positive um but if you don't want to do that, I would supplement it with a little bit of calcium. Um, good way that I've heard people do this before. It's totally impractical on a large scale. But if you compost, um, take your eggshells that you're composting, set them aside separately, grind them up, and put them back where you're going to be planting peppers. In oh, the okay. In the yeah, I've heard I've heard mixed stories about whether that calcium is available to be uptaken yeah. or not. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely compost my eggshells though for that reason. Plus it's also good pest control too, from what I read. So yeah. Um, yeah. That makes sense. The composting uh, at home is another really great way to do this. I know we compost on a very large scale. We actually take in, um, material from the city of Naperville when they do their, um, like their leaf pickups and things, right. We take in a lot of that material to compost. Yeah, oh, so, sorry, I was looking at the chat. Um, yeah, we take in the leaves from the city of Naperville, um, which is really awesome. The, so we get about 60 to 70 truckloads full of leaves from the city of Naperville, um, which is just a huge carbon source for us. And then we will also be getting this year several, truck tr several truckloads, pardon me, of horse manure from a local farm. I think the one we'll, we'll go with this year is about three miles away. Oh, nice. nice. So it's really nice to, yeah, last year we had to go a little bit further, like 20 miles or so. But even that I think is better than getting synthetic fertilizers, you know, coming in from half a world away. Yeah, yeah, of um, course. And, and yeah, so we compost on a really large scale here, but on at your home level, um, there are several different ways to do it. I know I've seen people have success by just keeping a compost bucket and dumping it all into a pile. And we do, I did a webinar on composting, so that is on the YouTube channel. So if you're interested in learning more about home composting, go ahead and check out that recording there too. Um, one little comment I wanted to make about our well, not our, but just integrated pest management in general. One of the, the things people will see a lot on their tomato plants are the tomato hornworms, those really great big green caterpillars on there. And they can be pretty destructive, but you know, they're, they're huge and everybody wants to know, well, what do I do with them? Well, what I've noticed a lot of times, you may see these white things sticking off their back. That's actually a parasitic wasp. And it's laid its eggs on the caterpillar. The larva of that wasp eat away at the caterpillar. And then when they hatch out of their cocoons, it, it effectively kills the caterpillar and, and um, creates more things that will kill more caterpillars. So um, it, it's one of nature's own ways of, of pest management that, that you can take advantage of, much like ladybugs that eat aphids. You know, a lot of times when we have a balanced ecosystem, nature kind of takes care of herself and, and keeps everything in check. A lot of times things that we humans do will knock things all out of whack and, and um, make them unbalanced. And, yeah, and the, so um, using nature is a great way to do that. Yeah, the, a lot of the agricultural pests, particularly like insects that we have are um, from Europe and from Asia and from the old world. And so- Where the crops are from. Exactly. Tomato hornworms are, I've also seen people even when they don't have these wasps, um, I guess they produce really beautiful butterflies. And so I've seen people, even like market gardeners, people who make a living from their tomatoes, just pick them off and put them in a bucket and kind of 
keep them as pets until they hatch up in these beautiful butterflies because in the end it's i think i said it before we don't hate the pest we but we really don't like the damage that it brings. right right kind of yeah different i i, I think it um tomato hornworms turn into a type of hawk moth if i'm not mistaken I think that's right yeah yeah i i used to have a bearded dragon and he loved to eat hornworms. So anytime <laughs> I would find one, I would just go feed them to my bearded dragon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. So I think we will go ahead and end it with that. Thank you so much for joining us, Jason. It was great to have you. Great learning about um, the, the farm side of things, which I don't always get a chance to see very much of. So um, Always great to hear things that are going on in the farm. And I will say as a, I think this is now my fourth year being a member of the CSA. This is, and, and it's, this is actually my, the third CSA that I belong to. Ours is by far the best. And I'm not just saying that because they're paying <laughs> me to. Um, it, it just, the quality of the produce is better than any other CSA I've belonged to. The quantity is always very good. Um, and I, I, I love being able to kind of walk around inside the barn and pick out the things that I want. You know, my family's not very big on kale, so I don't take kale, but I might take some extra potatoes or extra peppers or extra broccoli. Um, and, and so it's always really nice to be able to select the things that I know we're going to use and not end up with a bunch of things like, what do I do with celeriac? <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, Anyway, so thank you so much for the overview of everything and uh, take care, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. And we hope to see you again next week for more on October. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.